All right. By the way, oh, I need to put this up on the screen. Do that real quick. Uh, I have some funny, funny little story. I think I'm on Google's like list, right? That you know, naughty list? the naughty list, because you know they have you know Google videos of people being killed and all sorts of awful things, horror things, and then you have my training. And they're actually um, auditing all my training. And the top gun day three has been removed. Um, yeah, several of my uh, targeted prospecting removed for, um, yes, hateful speech. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm not kidding. So I just, I know I kept, um, Gabby and David kept saying, we can't see top gun three. I've uploaded it like, Good morning, Olivia. Olivia. How are you? Come on in. This is Olivia. She's part of the team. Welcome, welcome. Grab a seat. Sure. So anyway, yeah, I have been targeted by Google for um, hateful speech. <laughs> so I have said it's deadly to good. You. It's deadly good. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I have had them review choice and they won't put it back up. So I have decided that I can't say Top Gun because maybe gun, uh, right? So I'm going to be putting TP for now. And anything that might be saying like targeting or words that like could be construed as some stupid thing that they. Oh might my do. gosh. That is exactly <laughs> why. That is exactly yeah, why. Ridiculous. My husband was watching something about Sakaro and they're killing people. And I'm like, this is okay on YouTube. But my target of prospecting, no can do her, on a private list where I'm training my people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm on their list. Yes, me. Mm -hmm. So this is what I want you all to know. If you can't find my training, it's because it's been removed by Google because I am apparently the hateful speech person. You, I think a workaround might be if you just actually put it on a Google Drive and then have a shareable Google Drive link and people can go directly to that video. Well, I may have to start doing that. But unfortunately, I was trying to clean up my computer and I deleted a bunch of those. So I don't know if I can download it once it's removed. I, I don't know. I have to figure this out. So at any Yeah, you can. It just won't. The public won't see it. But yeah, you can download it. You can okay, well. Excellent. So I have more work for me to do because, you know, I just don't have enough to do. So that's excellent news. I'm super excited about that. <laughs> Thank you, Google. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's get into contracts. So what I've done, I teach contracts as a three hour CE class. And so since our classes are hour long, I took and divided it into three sections, as I normally would, because when I teach a CE, CE class, we take breaks on the hour for the restroom break. So the first hour is the nuts and bolts of the contract. The second hour is finance and contingency. The thir third hour is the difference between the as is and the residential. So this, uh, this day today is the nuts and bolts of the contract. Now, I would like you to grab, can you give her both contracts? If you guys can keep a hold of those two contracts for the next three weeks, if not, we'll just print new ones. It doesn't really matter, but we're going to be looking at both contracts and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. But the truth of the matter is guys, and the real point of you having both contracts today and the next day, if I can make this large is really because what I want you to see is that both of these contracts are absolutely the same until we get into day three the difference between them so the basic um, parts of the contract uh, are absolutely the same they may be a little bit different in the lines that they fall in but the financing contingency guys 100 percent the same how the con the contract lays out completely the same so the only thing different is really the maintenance portion of this contract okay that is truly how the contract differ we will get to that day three but i want you to see so i have a residential contract here and i have an as-is contract so if we want to we can refer back and forth but i want you to see that they are absolutely both the same okay now stop me if you have any questions we can look at either one for fun we're going to look at the residential just because you know i like that one better but really we could be looking at the as-is right now the only thing different is if i call out a line number we may not be on the same line okay but they're absolutely 100 percent the same now, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, obviously, we know where to get the information for buyer and seller. You guys are super smart. But I want to point out a couple of things that have come to pass. 
buyer or seller, mostly if you're representing the buyer. Let's say you wanted to put, the buyer was thinking about putting it into an LLC, but we didn't know who the LLC would be. Okay, we're gonna talk about assignment of contract. Um, but another way you could do that, you could say and or assigns here under buyer. So you could say who the person might be, Maria Smith and or assigns. That is a good way to start doing that if you're gonna be saying that this may be assignable. It's gonna remind you when you get to the assignment part of the contract, you need to make this assignable. Um, that is a really good way to do that. Um, one thing that I have always seen we could always add people to the contract. You could remove people as long as it wasn't the original person. But we actually came up with a, a contract and it was a high end contract. It was like over 2 million. And they actually thought about removing someone in the contract because it was not assignable. They said you couldn't remove somebody. Now that is taking it to the nth degree. So I'm going to say to err on the side of caution I would say if there's any chance you're going to be doing any changing of names at all, make your contract assignable. Okay, everybody with me? We'll cover that yes. a more when it's assignability, but you guys know that. I mean, that's a big one. Karen, now, I'm, so what should, I'm sorry, so what should you put there? Well, let's a lot of mine are assignable. assignable. Yeah, let's jump ahead to assignability because we can do that. This is an advanced group of people. Let's jump over to assignability. Mm -hmm. Did I pass it? Did I pass it? Mm, I might have passed it. This thing is not moving very smoothly. Mm -hmm. Hold on. You just go in the ads as there's less there. Hold on. Uh, this thing is like really jumpy. Okay. Oh, seriously? Number seven. There it is. Thank you. Assignability. <clears throat> now they changed this back in October and they added this bottom. So it says check one, buyer may assign and thereby be released from li further liability under the contract, may assign but not be released or may not assign the contract. This is what they added. If no box is checked, then buyer may not assign the contract. They checked that because this was one of those areas that they didn't have anything and people would not make an election. So what does that mean if somebody doesn't make an election, guys? Gray. You know how I hate that word, gray. It means the contract needs to be black and white. We need to know what both parties are agreeing to. And if we don't know, we can't proceed further, right? So that's why they've been adding these things because they understand that so many times realtors leave these things blank. Drives me into the agents, you know. I'm gonna say realtors, I hope we're better, right? But people leave them blank. Now, let me ask you, which one do you think not for my agents who've been with me for a long time, but newer agents who have not taken a contract class with me. Which one do you think, when you heard what I'm referring to, you should check? One. The second one. Tony, you can't answer because you've taken a class with me before. Oh, then disregard. <laughs> disregard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And person who has not taken the class with me, he may or may not be right. I'm not going to say. <laughs> Which one would you say? And then here's the kicker: Tony's silence. Why would it be a right answer if he was right? Anybody think? Peyton, what do you think? I've always put the second one. Why? Okay, see, that is the answer I hate because I was told to put that. And that's why we're doing that. What do you what do you guys think, Jonathan? Okay, I like that answer. I don't want to answer you. <laughs> Anybody else that hasn't taken it? Suzanne, yes. what do you think? I think you have to put the other one because if later they want to change your LLC or if they want to add people, you don't need to read with the contract. So which one do you think? The first one may assign and be released from liability or may assign but not be released from liability? May assign. The question is, should we release them from liability or not? No. Okay, so you're saying the second one. Okay, 
I'm torturing everybody for fun. Um, the, the difference is this, nobody is going to sign, allow, any real listing agent is never gonna say, oh sure, we're gonna let you get away without any liability. Because what the first one is actually saying is, Cassania goes into contract with me. I'm Centerline Homes. This was a true scenario. When we built the condominiums, you build in phases, it takes a long time. She goes in contract for 300,000, let's just say. Now we've had several releases and now the, con the condos are up to 400,000. Jonathan says to Cassania, hey, I'll buy it from you for 390. So she just made a cool 90 grand. He just saved 10 grand. And now he buys it from her and now he's in contract with Centerline Homes. That is what may assign and be released from liability. He never went into contract with us initially, but now he is in contract with us because he did an assignment from Ksenia. Why would a seller not like that? Because we always want to know, is the buyer really qualified, right? I don't know anything about Jonathan. I have no idea what his financial whereabouts are, right? I don't know if he really is qualified to purchase this. So most sellers would say, absolutely not. I want to know and I want to have the opportunity to say yes or no to that buy. Right? So assigning and being released from liability, that's probably never going to fly again. Except in like, what you know, wholesaling, which we really don't do. Let's say, right? But I'll tell you, builders, probably not going to see that anytime soon. You never know, right? Times are changing. <laughs> but <laughs> okay, fine. But yeah, um, but we did do that at Baldwin Park. That was the only place we did. The other one, she could not do that because then if she sold it to Jonathan, she's still liable to Centerline Homes, even though he's buying it. She, he's, she's still going to be the owner. She, when we close, it's going to be closing with Ksenia. She could put it under an LLC, but she still at some point is going to have to quickly deed it to him right? Because I'm not releasing her from liability. You understand? She's still part in contract with Centerline in that instance. You would follow me? That is the one I'm telling you, you want to keep in mind because if somebody wants to change it to an LLC, put it into a family trust, add a person apparently, or remove a person, it's the second one that you want to check. Now, if you say may not assign, that is may not change a thing. And to my point, I thought we could always add. You can add, you can remove if buyer and seller agree, but you are going outside of assigning if the contract. Wants to be a jerk. If somebody wants to be a jerk, in which, in which case we were involved in a jerky relationship between buyer and seller, <laughs> they would not allow the removal of a, of a person unless they were willing to put 50 gram down, which they weren't. So we were mm -hmm. stuck in that situation. So what I'm telling you is to make sure you're always protecting your customer. You want to err on the side. To make sure you're always protecting your customer. You want to err on the That was scary. Yeah, yeah. That was scary. Okay, whoever that is, we need to turn that off. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Uh, so at that point, you really have to understand the difference between assigning and not assigning. Is everybody clear on that? Yep. Carrie, I have a question because I'm in here. I'm in retirement zone um, area. And a lot of times they may decide to put it in a trust. I've had several of them. Always then put may assign, but not be released from liability. And when you send the contract, always say to the other side, by the way, we're saying we may assign, but be released from li not be released from liability because they may be putting this in a family trust. The agents on the other side do not know what this means. They will freak out. You will either, <laughs> you selected the wrong one. I love that one. Oh, whoops, you picked the wrong one. Uh, no, we actually chose it for a reason, right? Or no, we won't do this because they don't understand what that means. So if you simply tell them, we selected this on purpose and this is why, they're usually fine with it. Now, if you picked the first one, be released from liability, I don't think anyone's gonna be okay with that one. Mm -hmm. So yes, in your instance, if there's a chance at all that they could put it in a family trust, always go with the middle one. Mm -hmm. Because okay. the may not assign doesn't help anybody. And then sometimes for financing, the names don't match exactly, and the lender asks right. for uh, a name change and anything like that. You're initial. always safe because listen again, contracts are negotiable, but both buyer and seller have to agree to allow those changes. And if they don't, you're stuck with it the way it is until it closes, and then you have to pay to re-record it. 
And then if the lender won't agree, then you could get in a whole big mess where they're going to deny them. And it's ridiculous. So if you always defer to may assign but not be released from liability, you're safe. Everybody good with that? Yes. Second one. And not because someone told you to, but because you understand why you're doing it. Because you're going to have to explain that to the agent on the other side. Okay? Now let's talk about this personal property because they've really tried to beef up what they've included. So you can see now what they said. Now look, the seller, they've changed this a little. The following items which are owned by the seller and existing on the property as the date the initial offer was included uh, in the purchase. So what does that mean? Well, let's say they had that refrigerator that made cappuccino and sang to in the morning. <laughs> want that one <laughs> it was on the premises and it does say refrigerators so should it be conveying it should but what if in the garage they also had another refrigerator that they swapped it out could they also then say well that was also on the premises could you then get into a and then did you have a picture can you prove that they had the cappuccino one that sang to you in the morning now we're just getting gray again right i mean you could be accurate but how do you prove it oh no we didn't have the cappuccino one that's saying there you're mistaken no but i remember you know i mean now we're just in this semantics thing so what i'm going to tell you is if there is something specific like that always write that in there okay now tony you're not allowed to speak okay i said that my wife says that all the time okay well good <laughs> you should be used to it then <laughs> No one who's taken a class with me is allowed to answer this question for Peyton. She's like, oh my God, she's looking at me now. That's Peyton, that's Madeline, that's Suzanne. Let's see who's not taking a class. Corina can say this. All right, that's Ksenia, Jonathan, Olivia. She's like, oh my God, I just started today. Please leave me alone. <laughs> I am not here. <laughs> Here's the question. What if someone wrote her MLS? So in the MLS, because we all know that it doesn't say washer and dryer here, right? Those are the two items that are not listed here. What if it says in the MLS, the washer and dryer will convey? And the agent said over here per MLS, and they go to the walkthrough and there's no washer and dryer. Do we have to put the washer and dryer in? Thank you, Ms. Pippa, thank you. Karina, you say yes, why? Because it says per MLS? What do you think, Ksenia? Ksenia thinks yes. What do you think, Peyton? What do you think? Yeah. Jonathan? <laughs> per MLS means nothing. MLS is merely a, a portal for us to share information. And sadly, it's only as good as the information that's in there. Half the time is wrong, right? So the reality is what matters is what ends up on this contract. So per MLS means absolutely nothing. They needed to write washer and dryer. What if you printed the MLS? Now, if you printed the MLS and just sent it, it doesn't mean anything either. You actually have to incorporate it into the contract. Thank you, Maria. Does anybody know how to incorporate it into the contract? I copy and paste from the MLS. You wrote it in, but that's not actually incorporating the MLS. If you actually printed it, why don't incorporate? Because let's say they put a lot of really good things in the MLS, and you don't want to have to write it all on here. You can actually incorporate that document and make it part of your contract. Does anybody know how to do that? And additional terms. Close. Okay, well. Thinking. Stace, I like it. You're close. We do a lot of that out here. We got farms. <laughs> Listen, you guys do a lot, a lot of things out there. And it's <laughs> so just basically an addendum, right? So what you do is down here, over here, where it says all of these additional terms, you have all these agendas. <laughs> you check other. Yep. And you write MLS synopsis or whichever one. Now you have incorporated it into the contract. I also highly recommend getting everybody to initial it. Okay, because I'm a big fan of initialing everything. I'm from the builder world. We like everything signed. <laughs> Blood is better. No, okay. <laughs> but, 
So you would check other. Now this is also, let's say you wanted to do an inventory list. This is how you would incorporate the inventory list. You would check other and you would write inventory list. Anything that you wanted to make part of this contract, an agreement that should be part of the contract. Now notice I'm saying part of the contract. Does the lender get everything that's part of the contract? It is if you make it part of the contract. So if it goes as an additional part later, then, then maybe the lender wouldn't get it, right? But if it's part of the initial contract and you want to make it part of the contract and you put it here, remember the lender will see all of that. So keep that in mind. If yeah, it's something that- furniture, right? Exactly. So if it is an inventory list, if it's cash, who cares? Yeah. I would incorporate it in. Hey Raj! But if it's not cash and if it is a lender involved, then we wouldn't be incorporating an inventory list here. That would be done later. Yes, please. Outside of the contract, right? Um, and we would be, how would we be saying, for a lender purposes, how would we be saying that it comes fully furnished? $1, yes. So up here, under number, here we go. What's coming included? The home, uh, uh, the, the, I would say property uh, is conveyed fully furnished at no additional cost or value. Property, home, whatever is conveyed, comes fully furnished, however you wanna write that, at no additional cost or value. And then in a separate document, <laughs> That does not go to the lender. You have all your inventory lists all itemized, right? But that should not go to the lender. Everybody good with that? Yeah, at no additional cost or value. Now, here's another thing. They've tried to be much better about, now listen, if it says dishwasher, disposal, ceiling fans, light fixtures, do you have to write all those things? No, because it says that. I mean, we don't have to write drapery rods, guys, because there's nothing fancy about a drapery rod, right? Um, but if you go into a listing and they have really cool custom um, window treatments, you better ask the seller if they plan to take those because they're supposed to convey, right? I'm telling you, true story. We almost lost a deal about Target curtains. Target, they were cream. There was nothing special. I don't understand it. The sellers left with them. The buyers had a cow. We said, we'll give you a credit. They said, no, we had to ship them back from Colorado. Target curtains. That's worse than the ring doorbell issue. It was ridiculous. At least the ring doorbell, you can go anywhere and buy them. These were stupid Target curtains. They were awful. I don't even know why they liked them. But anyway. Actually, Tony, you brought up a good point. The ring, I've not dealt with that, but. Well, we're going to get there in a second because okay. they have added on here other things like thermostat. Well, what if it is. Uh, one of the smart thermostats, right? Could they have swapped it? Well, they're not supposed to swap it because it says it's supposed to be the one that was on site when you got there. But was it the nest? Did you take a picture of it? Did it say it was a nest? How do you know it was a nest? Also, if it's a smart home and they have all these smart things that go with the home, you need to have the main equipment that runs the smart home. Well, if you don't put here that that main equipment is staying, that is the most expensive part of the smart home. So you could be left with all these really cool things and now they have to spend thousands of dollars to make those things work. You guys know that, right? Also, a lot of times, some of these things that they have that will run like these different um, you know, uh, smart features, they have to be reprogrammed to the new owners. So you have to also say that the seller has to reprogram them for the new owner, because if they don't take themselves out, the new owner can't even use them. These are all things. If you see smart home, don't run. I mean, you might want to run, but don't run. You have to think through this and add this type of thing to the contract, okay? Because none of that's in here. And this stuff is, they try to make it as specific as they can, but it's not. So they've added television mounting hardware. That's really interesting. Television wall mounts. Because the question is, what's a fixture? Anybody know what a fixture is? Are we, is this, are we qualified or not? I don't know if I'm supposed to answer this. You're allowed to speak. <laughs> Anything that is, that is permanently affixed to the, to the dwelling. Well, what does that mean? Permanently affixed? Is it screws? Is it glue? Is it nails? Because let me tell you, there's three definitions of a fixture. So here is the real definition that they would constitute for real estate. 
if when you remove this item, it root like for example, if you take something away and it has ruined the uh, baseboards, that would be considered a fixture. So to your point, Stace, the ring doorbell, when it comes off, does not ruin the doorbell. So it is not a fixture. So these are the things you have to think about. The other thing it doesn't talk about here are what about the surveillance equipment throughout the house, the video surveillance equipment that they have, that everybody has, right? It seems like it's everywhere that everybody has those video surveillance. It doesn't talk about that here. Is that coming? And you know, we had a house, it was like a couple million dollars, a couple million dollars. We almost lost it because of cool cleaning equipment. Mm -hmm. Crawly, I put it a couple brushes. I mean, really? No, that is not supposed to convey. But when you are going through as a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, you need to ask, are you going to take that or are you going to leave that? Because these are the silly things that can kill your deal. Right? So I'm telling you, it's almost like a detective. <laughs> Another one, we had a deal. Again, it was like a $4 million house. This was the dumbest thing. Those solar lights that light up the path. Do you see solar lights in there? No, because they're not written there. So guess what? The seller took them. Guess what? The buyer almost dropped the deal for solar lights. The, you know who ends up buying all this stupid stuff? We do. Yeah, we do. We're the ones. Not me. You guys. I, I, don't, I don't contribute to that. <laughs> Gary, what about mailboxes? No, mailboxes are fixed to the ground or they're gangs. So no, nobody's going to take their mailbox. Oh, Ocala. <laughs> You can take your mailboxes. Okay. I just We're weird them. out here anyway, but but a deal did about a, a deal did years ago about fall through because of it. I'm gonna ask, do you plan to take your mailbox? Because they would need to replace that, right? So and then you would need to so anything that they plan to take, you would need to exclude. But in my point, a mailbox, I you know the biggest ones here, guys, chandeliers. People get so Yeah emotional about those dang chandeliers yeah they're gonna take the chandelier make them take it down make them take it down because if you forgot you put in the mls you know the chandelier does not convey right you had to put that everywhere but you forgot to put it here that chandelier's going well see and they didn't want to take the safe because it was too heavy to move but that safe was supposed to, it was bolted, bolted to the ground. So they're considering it a fixture. See, that would have been a question. Is the safe going? Those are the things. It doesn't say safe here. Is it because it was bolted, but if it was removed, would it ruin the floor? This is where you have to ask, is it truly a fixture or is it not? So those are the things. We had a deal that had a huge stupid fish on the wall. They left the dang fish. Okay, it really wasn't a fixture. They just didn't want to take the stupid fish. We made them come and take the dang fish. We're like, this is not a fixture. We had to go through the whole what the definition of a fixture was. It was ridiculous. I had an elephant head. Yeah, people don't want to take these things, but we have to understand, but you have to be a... Was it an elephant head? No, it was some other kind of like a moose head. No, no, it was from Indonesia and it was a... a it was a true elephant head, but we made the, the, the buyers decided to, to purchase it. The people could not get it down. Okay. It was wall size. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that, whether you're buy side or sell side, I'm just gonna tell you all this stuff that they try to be so good about, they're not really that good, okay? You have to be the ones on top of it, both on what comes and what does not go. And just know, I don't care what the heck it says in the MLS, none of that matters. It's what's in the contract that matters. When you come to me and you ask me, hey, Carrie, does this go? I'm going to say, what's in your contract? Because it's mm -hmm. only what's in the contract that matters. Everybody good with that? Yep. That's how it's going to go. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the money because this part always makes me laugh. All right. Contracts. Let's say we went into, uh, we have, well, let's first ask what constitutes, sorry about that, Olivia. What constitutes an effective date? Let's say Peyton sends me an offer on our listing and uh, my sellers sign it and I get it back to Peyton on the hey, first day at 11.58 p.m. She has I was calling you. What did I do? 
Who is Beverly? That's Beverly. Okay, Beverly. Where Wasn't too hot. I love it, love it. Okay, I love it, love it. I don't know where this is going, but we might want to mute this. <laughs> You're welcome, baby. See Miss Beverly. Call me on your lunch. Did you? Okay. Contracts here. I mean, in cover. <sighs> okay. So, as you were saying, so uh, a, a le- Thursday, eleven fifty nine. I sent it back to Peyton. Peyton gets up on Friday. She works out. She goes to the gym. She finally sees it in her inbox. It's nine o'clock in the morning. She says it to her buyers. Oh, woohoo! We're in contract. What day is the effective date? You're not allowed to answer, Tony. Nobody who's been in my contract class can answer this. Only new people can answer this. Is the effective date Thursday or is it Friday? Friday? Who thinks it's Friday? Who thinks it's Thursday? Who does not want to answer me? Okay. Thursday, I got it and got it back to her by 11.59 p.m. Friday, she gets up, she works out, she sees it, she gets it back to her buyers. So who thinks it's Thursday? Who thinks it's Friday? It's Thursday. (laughs) It does not matter when she sees it. It does not even matter when her buyers see it. It's when it has been delivered. It was delivered by 11.59 p.m. Now, if it was 12.05 a.m. in the morning, then it would be Friday, right? So it's all party signed and is delivered. So that is what makes an effective date. It does not matter when you see it. It matters when it was delivered. And that's why it's great that we have timestamps in our inbox, right? Now, I'm going to tell you this. No agent ever knows what the effective date is. So it is very important that you always send to the other side, congratulations, looking forward to working with you. The effective date is because every date in your contract is based off of that effective date. And it's every very date. very helpful for your lender. When you and especially to Maria, because obviously she's- obviously, I <laughs> it's Well, I always do a couple days before that anyway, to make sure that's the <laughs> that they send the effective Which we love that. <laughs> but here's another one. Okay, so now we know the effective date is Thursday. And they, uh, it's three days to get the money. And we said, what is the money due? Who thinks the money is due on Monday? Who thinks the money is due Tuesday? You think Tuesday? How many people think Tuesday? How many people think Monday? How many people are not going to answer me at all? Or people who think Wednesday? Do we have any Wednesdayers out there? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Escrow. Is it calendar days or is it business days? Nope. Calendar. Calendar. The entire contract has been calendar days since September of 2017. They changed that. Believe it or not. So here's the trick. Everything. I know, right? Everything in the MLS is business days. Everything in contracts is calendar days. Here's where it gets tricky. That means that you count the weekends. You would count the holidays. However, if it lands on a weekend or it lands on a holiday, you would actually move the day the money was due or the day the inspection was up or whatever to the next business day. So in this instance, that's why I made it a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday would be the day the money is due, but obviously you can't give money to anybody on a Sunday. So the money would be due Monday. Does that make sense? I was being ultra tricky on purpose. Okay, just Carrie, Mm -hmm. to confirm, just so I make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. So I always thought that escrow was due business days, like three business days, but you're saying everything in the contract Mm -hmm. is calendar days. Mm -hmm. Yep, that had switched back in 2017, actually. Okay. Yep, there is no business days in our contracts at all. Unless I have seen people write that in, which is really confusing. Now, in certain contracts, it could be different, but not in as is for any residential. All of this is exactly the same, no matter what contract you're in. 
which is why it's really important. See, it says check one, never say a company's offer, never give money with the offer is to be made. And it says if left blank three days, always think through what that three days would be because they have to get the money there in that time frame. Now here's another one. Let's say your customers called in, they say, hey, to the title company, will you take a personal check? And the title company says, yeah, sure. So on Monday, in comes a personal check. And on Tuesday, you receive a release and cancellation. You're like, what? Can that happen? What do you guys think? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because the personal check has the clear. Absolutely. A personal check is not real cash. That money is probably not good until three or four days. So never let your buyers, and let me tell you, when it was a really hot seller's market, that happened all the time. I had a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, what happened? So my agents knew never to do that, but it was happening. When I taught contract classes in a lot of places, people were like, oh my God, that happened to me. Of course it did, because people were using that, because what happened over the weekend? They got a lot of backup offers that were better than the offer that you sent in. <laughs> cancel the contract so they had to wait till you were in default right they couldn't do, move the other contract ahead till your contract was in default your contract was in default as soon as the money didn't come on time because even though yeah you got a check in it was a personal check now if they wired the funds if they did um what's the other cashier's check that's instant cash they couldn't do anything they were stuck right you know the number one call i got from uh, agents about their sellers during all the crazy how do i get out of this deal and I have to tell them. I have to tell them the ways they can get out of the contract because that's my job. I represent buyers, I represent sellers. I have to tell them how the contract works for them, no matter what it is. So you have to know the contract better than everybody. You have to know how to protect your customer, right? That's the most important thing. Okay. So it's only Sundays or holidays, right? Saturday, Sunday, or holidays. Mm -hmm. Which essentially are business days, but Thank you, thank you, Madeline. Yeah, so it used to be, this changed in October, which I really hate, because I really liked this. They put in this thing till 5 p.m. That was so nice, they took that back out again. So now everything in the contract is till 12 p.m. or 11.59 p.m., which is stupid, because that's not really true in terms of getting your escrow in, because no company is gonna be open till 11.59. So real, realistically, if the title company or the attorney, whoever's collecting the the monies is not is not open after 5 p.m., let's say, they still missed it, right? So even though the deadline is 11.59, it won't matter because they didn't process the funds in time. That benefit, that- Right, right. Well, that benefits anybody that is sending money via crypto. Crypto or wire, yeah. Yeah, crypto, yeah, that benefits them because then that doesn't, you can have that, that, I mean, yeah, anytime. Okay, this escrow agent, the great news is, guys, that this is now uh, a field in, you guys know, in the MLS now. I love that. It was such a pain in the neck when you had to try to get in touch with the agent to find out who their title company was going to be. Um, if you, for some reason, they didn't fill that in and you needed to know, you still could put TBD by seller, right? The most important thing is as soon as you know, you have to fill this in. As soon as you have an executed contract, this has to be filled in. But let's say... Cassinia had a buyer. She, uh, for I'm just going to be me. It was me. I'm the terrible listing agent. I didn't fill it in because my my sellers are so annoying. They hadn't decided yet, and finally they decided. So I tell her who it's going to be. It's going to be Phil, Phil Logos. So now she puts it in. This is a day. Now it's a day after. Let's say make it two days after the effective date. So now is the effective date two days later because she's made a change. And does it have to be initial by all parties? Ooh, who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Who is never gonna answer me because you guys are all just sitting there staring at me. <laughs> I get this question a lot. The answer is no. This is not a change to the contract because first of all, we already know this is already a decision that both parties have made. I've already decided, or not me, the seller, right, has already decided who the escrow agent is going to be. Buyer's agents already agreed to use their company. They just didn't know who it was going to be, right? So there's no change in terms of the contract. What would make the effective date different and make it a counteroffer is if the terms of the contract change. The closing date changes, 
the amount of deposit, you know, those kinds of things. Those are terms to the contract that would make it then a counter offer. And now your effective date changes, right? This is not a term in the contract. This is just filling in. So nobody else has to initial this and it does not change the effective date of the contract. Okay. But it does need to be filled in. And I will definitely thank you because this is the number one thing that if we're audited, DBPR will go crazy over. Buyers must know where their money is and how to get it. Number one thing. Okay. Now the additional deposit, you guys know that that we love to use because it makes our offers stronger, right? So this is a really big thing for us. So again, it's after the effective date. That's why you really got to know what that effective date is. And we always like to put it after the inspection, right? That's the whole point. Way to keep some of that escrow safe, because let's be honest, how many times have we seen, sadly a lot, where the contract, the buyers within their rights to cancel the contract, to the financing contingency or something and the seller says i don't care i'm not giving you back your deposit and we're like are you kidding me here's the financing contingency we're well within the loan approval period here's a denial from our lender no and now we're in an escrow dispute it's possible because the title company see this is something you all need to understand let me go through, take my moment on my soapbox when brokerages would hold the escrow. Brokerages are part of the contract in the sense that we all are now, we would go put it in through an escrow disbursement order and would go to FRAC. And FRAC would then review the contract. They would say who's supposed to get the money based upon the contract and then they would determine that and the money would go to them, right? It was great. So basically what's in the contract would actually be how it would be handled. Unfortunately, no brokerage wants to hold escrow because that's the number one reason that we get audited, right? So what happens is we use title companies. Title companies are not part of the contract. Title companies are not governed by FREC or DVPR. They have their own policies, their own procedures, and every title company handles escrow disputes differently, which is why that's the first question you have to ask, answer, ask your preferred title partner. I don't care how great they are, what a great celebration they are, how nice they are, how terrific they are in answering your questions. If they don't handle escrow disputes well, do not work with them because that is the only time you really need them. Because this is what happens. We have one right now and guess what they did? They said, sorry, tell your buyer, your seller that they have to contact the courts. Yep, that's exactly what they said. And the seller was like, what do you mean I have to contact the courts? They want us to get involved, contact the courts. I'm sorry, we're not gonna contact the courts. We are not the title holder. We are not party to the title. We do not hold your escrow. We're not attorneys. We're not gonna do that. We can't. So you picked this title company, we sure didn't. <laughs> so you have to follow whatever their process is and that's what they want you to do. And then he's like, well, can I work it out between the buyer and seller? You can if you want to, that's what they said. They would not do anything horrible title company in case there is an escrow dispute what is your process straightforward that is exact because some people just send a letter and say they have to work it out on their own if that is their answer run if they say well we'll try to work out an amicable you know solution between the two parties that's who you work with that is exactly the, the answer that you want to have I mean, sometimes they can't, right? And has, they have to maybe go into some kind of bargaining, bargaining arbitration or something like that. But do they try to facilitate some kind of amicable solution? Because as an agent on the buy side, for example, or as an agent, let's say we're representing the seller, are we allowed to talk to the buyer? Yes, no, who thinks we can talk to the buyer if we're representing the seller? Nobody ever wants to answer me. You guys are all scared to death already, boy oh boy. We are not allowed. That's the to, question. Are we allowed to talk to the buyer if we represent the seller? Yes. No. No. That is a code of ethics violation. Don't do it. Carrie's Carrie actually is uh, stuck up for me before on one of those. When remember they were talking to my people, and I'm like, hell no. Yes, hell no. <laughs> hey, Carrie, hell no. I'll get right to their broker. Code of ethics violation. You can only speak to the agent on the other side and if the agent on the other side is not working this out or has disappeared. Has that happened? Yes. Then what do you do? And then the broker doesn't do anything. That's what happens guys. This is why you need a good title partner. Okay. You 
really got to think about that. If you're on the buy side, you can't help it, right? But if you're on the sell side, you better pick a really good title partner that understands what it's like and explains to you how to handle that. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, yeah. that was the dispute. So that's why I tell you, it's great. If you want to put down a really big deposit, I suggest breaking it up. Putting some down here, but putting more down additional deposit after the inspection. You're still showing a lot of strength, but at least, Lord forbid, it goes into an escrow dispute. You've saved some of the money. So we want to use uh, D for after, where it says other after the inspection, because no. it doesn't. B, 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 additional deposit. Other is more like if you have a portfolio, or you know, like if you have like a gift of funds rather, or if you have like others different. It's the additional deposit. That's what you're talking about, B. Got it. Okay. Financing. Okay. I'm going to highly recommend that everybody uses a dollar amount here. You guys are pretty good at figuring out. You start at the total amount. We're going to look at that real quick. Um, this is one that really drives me crazy, guys. And I don't really, I know you guys know how to do this, but we're going to make sure everybody does. Don't accept this from anybody. Balance. Underline number E. Why do people write balance? You see there's a dollar sign here? And it says balance to close, not including buyers, closing costs, and pre-reads. Why do they write balance? It doesn't make any sense. This has got to be explaining to the buyer and to the seller how they're coming up with the money, right, that they're using to purchase this property. So we're going to do a very two very simple money things here, just to make sure everybody knows how to do this. So on your little contracts that everybody has, and the, those of you who don't have a contract, just use a piece of paper, the purchase price is 100 grand. Okay, we're just gonna use very simple numbers. You're putting down $1,000. You're getting 95% loan to value. Okay, 95.5. How much money do you need to close? 4,000. Everybody tell me what you think. Not Tony, you already said. Shh. No. <laughs> okay. So again, So if we have a hundred thousand dollar purchase price, right? And we subtract a thousand dollars for the deposit, and we subtract ninety-five thousand dollars for the loan, how much do we need for the balance? What do you think, Peyton? The purchase price is a hundred thousand. They're putting a thousand down. The ninety-five percent loan to value. They're getting 95.5. They're putting down 95. They're getting 95% loan to value. How much do they need to bring to the closing table? How much? Do, yeah. 4,000 because they're bringing 4,000. I wanted to hear what she said. What did you get? 4,000. Okay, what'd you get? Yeah. What'd you get, Continue. 4,000. Madeline? It is, it's $4,000 because you simply go down the line. You take 100,000, you subtract from your 100,000, 1,000, right? From the 100,000, you subtract your 95,000 for the loan and it leaves you 4,000, right? So now we're gonna make it a little bit harder. Tony, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> this is a VA loan, same thing. It's a hundred thousand dollar property, which of course is non-existent, but we're just going to make believe. They're putting a thousand dollars down because VA still needs to put money down. It's a hundred percent loan value. How much is the balance to close? Thousand dollars. What do you think? What do you think? Zero, what do you think, Madeline? $100,000. They're putting a $1,000 deposit. It's 100% loan to value. What do you think, Ksenia? Zero, what do you think, Karina? Zero? What do you think, Madeline? Okay, so we've got a couple zeros, a couple negative a thousand. What do you guys online think? Zero. Zero? Tony, you should know better. If it was zero, 
then it wouldn't be 100% financing, right? Because if it's $100,000, we subtract the $1,000, we subtract, how much are they getting for the loan? $100,000. They're going to get $1,000 back. Otherwise, they're not getting 100% loan to value. Mm. If you say zero, then they're not really getting 100% loan to value. They would be getting 99. Right. Balance is minus 1,000. So anytime you're doing VA or USDA, it's always minus your deposit. Because if you're getting 100% financing, whatever you're putting down for your deposit, you're getting back. Yeah, you might use it for closing costs. It's negative. It's minus because you're getting it back, right? So this over here is going to be minus whatever your deposit is. Because you're, you might use it for your closing costs or whatever. But the point is, this uh, right here, your financing amount should equal the purchase price. That makes sense? Because it's 100% financing. So whatever is your deposit. So if you did a loan, let's say the purchase price is 1.5, which we've seen VAs for 1.5 million, and your loan is 1.5 million, and you put 25,000 down, you're gonna get 25,000 back. Make sense? Okay, a big one that I see guys, is let's say you put down, a, let's say just the example 100,000, you put down a thousand and then you put down 99,000 here, right? What does that say? Cash, right? Yeah. And then you get to the second page and it says B, this contract is contingent upon financing. <laughs> what? <laughs> this happens a lot. So what is it? Is it cash? Or is the financing? You've got to go back to the buyer and say, the buyer's agent, which is this? Do not accept the contract where the first page does not equal the second page. What are they trying to pull here? Either it's a cash deal or it's not. If you're trying to make it contingent upon financing, you need to show that here. Never ever accept a contract where the first page does not equal the second page. You could say, which we're gonna cover next class on the financing contingency, that it's A, they're getting, uh, they're not gonna get, they're gonna cash, but they're gonna get a loan, right? A, this is a cash transaction with no financing contingency, but they might get a loan, right? You could say that, but that's fine. Then it's not contingent upon the loan, but this has to be, showing cash and then that has to show cash one can't say it's contingent and then not show a loan here does that make sense everybody yep. got that any questions on that that one drives me crazy this one also drives me crazy if not signed by the buyer and seller and an executed copy delivered to all parties on or before blank this offer shall be deemed withdrawn so so many times let's say you know Becky wants to get an offer in quickly because they're trying to get a good deal. So she says by Friday at 5 p.m. And then Madeline says, oh, sorry, the sellers aren't going to look at it till Sunday. Right? Not that Madeline would do that. But people are doing that, right? They've been doing that. So Becky has to change this offer because if she doesn't, this offer's dead by Friday at 5 p.m. Right. So what was happening was there were so many offers coming in agents were looking for reasons to not show the offer right if you had 25 offers how different could 25 offers possibly be so good how many of these are dead we don't have to show the dead offers you don't have to no, no if it's a dead offer you don't have to show the dead offer you only have to show the active offers and it's your fault as the agent if you submit a dead offer you're supposed to be the professional so you have to know if they're not going to show that offer until Sunday, then you need to change the date. And I would suggest going to Monday because they say Sunday now, but they probably don't mean Monday or Tuesday, right? So you need to know that you need to take this offer back or, you know, do another one and change this date 
to make this an effective offer. So that way, when they look at it, you actually have a real offer that they're looking at. Does that make sense? And if you left it blank, you yeah, there's no if left blank. No, that's for the counter offer. Unless otherwise stated, time for acceptance of any counter offers shall be within two days after the counter offer date is delivered. So they have, if they deliver you back a counter, you have two days to accept that counter. That's a counter offer. So this is the point here. This, if you don't have this signed here, you don't even have an effective offer. It's a dead offer before you even send it. Now, let's Carrie, what would you put? Like, I it depends on what the situation is. If there's multiple offers on it, I don't want them to keep showing it, trying to beat my offer. So, what what date would you normally, in a normal market, put there? Well, if they're going to be actually looking at the offer, remember, code of ethics states it's the agent's, the realtor's job to show the offer as soon as possible. That is their, that is the code of ethics. That's what we have agreed upon in the code of ethics. However, because of the multiple offer situations, when they put in multiple offers, they would say what day that the sellers would be looking at these offers. So you would have to call the agent and say, are there multiple offers? What day would the seller be looking at it? If, the, if they say oh, the sellers are just looking at them anytime, then I would make it due maybe in two days. Like if today is a Monday, maybe make it due by tomorrow at 5 p.m. If they're gonna be looking at it, now, the other thing, code of ethics, we are allowed to make sure that the offer was presented as long as it's an active offer. So we can't say that the buyer or sell, the sellers have to initial it, but we can make sure that the broker gives us an acknowledgement that it was shown. That is actually code of ethics. They changed that a couple of years ago. Uh huh. It's depending on this date. This date has to be beyond when you're um, going to be making the offer. If this date has passed, the offer is dead. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's deemed withdrawn. Okay. Now let's talk about the closing. This is really great. We said something called a dry closing. So what would happen is the funds wouldn't be there, but people would sign, and so they considered it a dry closing. They don't do that anymore. They have to have all the funds in order to be considered an actual closing, which is nice because there was like, do the sellers get the, get the keys to the buyer? Do the buyers get to take the property? Because what if, and this happens, it was a dry closing, the funds were coming from another country, but guess what? They gave the keys to the buyers, the buyers moved in, and then the funds never came. Now you have to evict the people who took over the property. Your story happened a couple times that I know of. So now you cannot have that happen because there's no actual closing until the funds are there. Isn't that so much nicer now? You like that. Now, the other thing is the closing shall occur on at the time. Do we write on or before? New agents, no, Tony? Okay. No. Here we go. Never. And I dare you to call the legal hotline and ask him that because that's always so fun to watch that. Uh, they will tell you absolutely not because it must be a specific date to be considered an effective contract. If the buyer and seller do not know when the closing is going to happen, then you don't even have an effective contract. It can't be ambiguous. They have to know, okay, this is going to close on the 28th of November. If you choose to move the date, then all parties can agree upon that. But there has to be an actual closing date or you actually have no effective contract. Mm -hmm. They get really strong on that. So just for fun, call the legal hotline and ask that question. <laughs> for fun, I've called them. <laughs> so they really get upset about that. Don't use your name. Use someone else's name, like someone who oh, use hers. <laughs> Oh, that would be really fun. Yeah. Well, in my brokerage, we always write on her before. That would be really good. <laughs> anyway, uh, so never do that. And then, by the way, title companies love to get you to rewrite addendums writing on or before because they have no idea about contract law. So do not do that. Write on. The closing, buyer and seller agree the closing date will be blank. You can change it as many times. Never, ever try to get a deal by running a quicker closing day and assume, oh, we can always get an extension. 
because that's a bad assumption. Most of the time, <laughs> sellers, especially of late, will say no. And then what happens? Your buyer's homeless and sometimes homeless and poor because they lost their money. And now they really don't like you at all. So these are all bad things. So always make sure to err on the side of caution, giving yourself more time on the closing date because you can always much easier move it up than you can to move it out. So always ask the lender how much time they need and then give them extra days. And if you have someone who is doing a VA loan and says they could do that in 30 days or 28 days, don't ever believe them. Especially if it's Navy Federal because they're lying. They can't even do it in 45. Okay, so extension of closing day. Oh, we're really at the time, but I wanna finish. Do you guys have a couple minutes just to finish up uh, one or two things real quick? Because the extension yes. of closing date is really important. This ties into um, the um, the financing. We're going to talk a little bit more about that with the CFPB requirements. But I wanted to talk about it in the terms of force mayor. We'll talk about it next time when we talk about financing contingency for CFPB requirements. Force mayor. This is something that mayor we've talked about a lot lately because of the hurricane. The hurricane has caused, obviously, acts of God. Let's just look really quickly at force majeure, shall we? It's down here at G. Let me go here really quickly. They changed this, which was really funny, back in October to add the most ridiculous things into this force majeure section. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, where is it? Let me get to G. Good Lord. It's going so slow. Come on. There it is. There it is. is. Yep. There it is. It started right here. Buyer or seller shall not be required to exercise or perform any right or obligation under this contract or be liable to each other for damages so long as performance or non-performance of the right or obligation or availability of services, insurance, or required approvals essential to closing is disrupted, delayed, Calls are prevented by a force majeure event. Now, this is what's funny. This is what they've changed. The force majeure event. Hurricanes, floods, extreme weather, earthquakes, fires, or other acts of God. Those were normal. Other transportation delays, war, <laughs> insurrections, civil unrest, acts of terrorism, governmental actions, mandates, governmental shutdowns, epidemics, and pandemics. Those are all new. They added all those. So basically, anything possible is not force majeure. But... The force majeure event will be deemed to have begun on the first day of the effect of the event that prevents the performance or non-performance, okay? All time periods affected in the force majeure event, including the closing date, will be extended a reasonable time up to seven days after the force majeure event can no longer prevent the performance under the contract. Now, this can continue up to 30 days after that point, then buyer and seller could be released from the contract and nobody has any harm. So what this is saying is you didn't need extensions of things if it was caused by force majeure. So if you couldn't get an inspection, you didn't need an, ex an extension of that because the, maybe the inspectors couldn't go out because the roads were totally flooded and they couldn't drive, right? If you uh, didn't need, for example, uh, maybe there was no electric, so you couldn't, or maybe there weren't binding insurance, so you couldn't close anything because you couldn't get insurance policies. So we had to be very careful with this force majeure clause, because if you started to go around it and create your own addendums, you could actually negate the language of the contract in the force majeure section. If, what happens is that realtors like to be very creative on their own, and they create their own addenda. And by doing so, they actually negate the contract. So this is where you always have to be very careful. We didn't have too much of that here, so we didn't have to really worry about that. But this has become a huge issue in Southwest Florida, as you can imagine. So when agents would go on their own and write their little addendas, thinking they're all super smart and trying to extend things and change things, they actually negated the force majeure section. Very bad. You don't want to change the contract. Anybody in here an attorney? In the state in the country in the state of florida okay so therefore we don't want to play one definitely not in real life and maybe on tv but not here so that's by the way a third degree felony so we have to be very careful when you want to change a contract that like writing an addenda are we allowed to write addendas who thinks we can 
Peyton's like, I'm not answering anymore. We can fill them in, but we can't write them. Cause that would, we can fill them in, but we can't write them because they'd be practicing law. Exactly. We are only scribes, guys. We can write buyer and seller agree and write what they agreed to, right? Very simplistic words. But as soon as we start saying this contract is contingent upon section seven of the blah, 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 we are acting like attorneys. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to jail for you. I don't look good in orange. I really don't like stripes. Okay. <laughs> so you're on your own, my friends. Uh, yeah. We have to be very careful that we are simply writing what the buyer and seller are agreeing to, okay? I'm gonna leave you with one last thing before we call the, this part of our contracts uh, a day. And then I'll ask, uh, also, are we party to this contract? I mean, we write our names here, right? Are we part of the contract? No. No. This contract is between the buyers and the sellers. No, we are guides. We and assist them. Happens, no, our job is to find the properties, to put the buyer and seller together and to help the transaction. We're not responsible, we're not attorneys. We cannot, no. So you have to be very careful and know your line. We have to show them the contract, help them make sure they read it, right? But at the end of the day, if they don't understand it, they need to talk to an attorney. We have to be very careful that we stay within our lines. And the other thing is we can never, ever, never, ever. I was going to ask somebody, but I just didn't want to torture poor Peyton again. She's like, thank God, because <laughs> never, ever write your commission here. If you write your commission here, guys, which I see a lot of agents doing, not my agents, but other agents, that's a code of ethics violation. People write it next to their name. Yeah, it's horrible. And what that is a violation of Article 1. Because in Article 1, we have to put our customer's um, needs above our own, right? That's the whole point. The customer must come first. But what if in the MLS, they're saying, okay, it's a you know, 2% commission or something like that. And you're writing three here. Is that saying that we're only going to do this deal if you give us more commission? Like we don't know, and that is a violation of, and people who try to negotiate the commission and say, uh, we want more higher commission, that is a violation of the code of ethics. We have to accept the offer of MLS cooperation. That is what we've agreed upon by the Realtor Code of Ethics. And so when we do that, we are putting our needs above the needs of the customers that we serve. You need to keep that in mind because if you do that, you are putting yourself in front of the needs of your buyer, in which case you are really being very happy. You know, you're definitely violating the code of ethics. And if anybody finds that, they can easily put you up in, in front of the board. That's a bad one. So never ever put your uh, numbers. That's a big thing in Miami. They do that all the time. All right. So with that, I'm going to stop my share. We've had a little fun on our first day of contracts. Anybody learn anything? All right, so glad to see everybody in my room. Look, everybody. Woo! Big room, big room. Woohoo! Love it. So, we will see you next week. Next week's going to be so much fun. My favorite part of the contract. Hi, Nancy. See, we'll talk about the CFPB requirements. Have some fun. Um, but you guys have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Carrie. Bye. Bye.